is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. This is Matthew chapter 1, uh, beginning at the 18th verse. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good, good morning and welcome. <laughs> it is, uh, it's great uh, to see you here and uh, for us to be together on this day. It is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we are continuing to, uh, to walk our way through this season of Advent, and in order for us to mark the time and to be able to do that, we've been using the Advent wreath, and each of the candles has had a meaning, a theme um, for the day, peace and joy and hope, and, uh, and for, day, for today, it is love. It is love. And so, uh, so we want to look at the word love, and again, it's in, as we look at these, at these words, it really does have to do with recapturing the vocabulary of our faith because our culture around us uh, uses the word love. It uses the word love a lot. And so it's important for us to acknowledge that that, the, that word is out there in our culture a lot. We use that word a lot. And yet, as we come to our faith, uh, then all of a sudden there is a, a deeper meaning. There is a deeper place to which our faith and the revelation of Jesus Christ takes us. And so we want to be able to look at uh, this word love, and yet to acknowledge that we're in a context where love is all over the place. It would be hard to find a theme or a word that was more written about, spoken about, sung about, thought about, uh, than the word love. There are lots of definitions that are out there. There are lots of people who have, who have tried to kind of capture it or share their experience. Um, some. Uh, one writer says, love is like a fever which comes and goes quite independently of the will. Another says, um, love can change a person the way a parent can change a baby, awkwardly and often with a great deal of mess. Uh, another one. Um, love is an untamed force. When we try to control it, it destroys us. When we try to imprison it, it enslaves us. When we try to understand it, it leaves us feeling lost and confused. I'd hate to be married to that guy. <laughs> and then finally, uh, love is kind of like when you see a fog in the morning, when you wake up before the sun comes out. It's just a little while, and then it burns away. Love is a fog that burns with the first daylight of reality. There are lots of definitions of love that are out there. There are lots of experiences of love that are out there. There are lots of views uh, of love that are out there. And so, uh, so we come then to this morning and say, well, how do we, uh, how do we attempt to kind of tease it apart and to, and to understand this huge theme of love? Well, so we look a little bit at context and at culture. So uh, if we go back to, uh, to the words of our tradition, back to uh, Greek, 
uh, the Greek language. The New Testament was written in Greek, but before the New Testament, um, there were at least four words that were used for love. And so it's no wonder sometimes that we get um, confused. They had four different words that were somehow associated with the word love. The first one was storge, and it means uh, affection in some way. It, it, it describes the kind of a relationship that you might have with a pet. Um, affection, kind of um, reaching down and petting it, um, uh, being enduring uh, to it. Uh, the second word uh, is, uh, is phileo, or friendship, the bond of friendship. And so it is comrades at arms. It is somebody who is a co-equal um, with you and that, and that you're able to do things with and bond together as friends. Uh, eros is another word, erotic love we might think of. It certainly is the love of sexual passion, uh, but it's also just passion. So it could be the, the, the love for music or the passion for beauty. Uh, so those several words are words that the Greeks used to describe different phases or different kinds of this love. And then they had a fourth word, and that fourth word was the word agape, agape. But by the time that the New Testament arrived, uh, it had really fallen pretty much into disuse. It described uh, the relationship between unequals. It might describe the relationship between a king and his kingdom or the people who were part of his kingdom. Uh, it also might describe uh, the relationship between a god and, uh, and his subjects, or the people who were, um, who were living on earth. Uh, but as time went on, and as you looked at the different kinds of uh, stories and myths around, uh, around the place of, of that kind of relationship, it would be difficult to think of the relationship between a king and his subjects in Greek or Roman history, or a god and the people as being a relationship of love. It was oftentimes anything but. And so the word really fell uh, mostly into disuse uh, until the coming of the New Testament. And with the coming of the New Testament, all of a sudden the writers latched onto that word as a way of being able to describe what they had experienced in this all of a, all of a sudden, this, this story, this tremendous good news that in Jesus, God had become human flesh. So think about it. So uh, as into this world of all different kinds of other loves, uh, here is the very Son of God who is at the right hand of God the Father, perfectly wealthy, perfectly powerful, untouchable. You can't, you can't hurt him. You can't betray him. Got everything that anybody could ever want or hope for. Uh, and, and as he and the Father looked down on the human condition, they were moved with love. And so, um, by the gift of the Father, the Son comes, and he takes on the form not of, a, not of a Lord that sits on a throne on a mountain, and everyone has to come and somehow subject themselves to him because of his awesome power, but who comes as a gift in a defenseless little baby who can be hurt, who needs to be cared for, <coughs> who all of a sudden um, in a very war-torn and violent part of human history, subjects himself to all of human frailty and enters into our condition as the presence of love among us. And then the willingness to, to endure and to grow and to be able to then describe the presence and the opportunity of this new kingdom that he himself would inaugurate at the hand of his father. So this opportunity for him to be able to walk into relationship and to be able to, to transform the various relationships of, with enemies and with powers and with disciples that are unfaithful, all of those things, to continue to walk the road of this new kind of love, allowing himself to be betrayed and, and abused and buried in the ground, and then the third day, by the power of love, raised up to new life and forever vindicating this new understanding of what love was. It's as if um, uh, Soren Kierkegaard uh, tells the story, the old Danish philosopher tells the story about a king who is awesome in power and in wealth. And, uh, and his wife is, has died. And he, uh, he <coughs> knows that he should marry. And there are many princesses around uh, his, his territory that are that are wanting to marry him, um, but he knows that they just want to marry him for the sake of his tremendous wealth and his tremendous power. 
Uh, and so he knows that he uh, wants to marry, and yet he's, he's, he's racking his brains in terms of, well, so everybody, everybody, everybody wants me for this tremendous, awesome power. Once they, once they walk into uh, my presence, I have the, the power of life and death over them and such tremendous wealth at my disposal. Uh, if they were to say yes to me, I know that it's only because of what it is that I represent to them. Uh, that, that they say yes. And so there's no freedom in terms of this relationship. I so overwhelmed them um, with my power. And he was kind of muttering and thinking about this, this quandary of his as he was looking out um, his window and he saw a stable girl um, walk by um, his window down in the street below. And he watched her and he said, her, she's the one. She's the one. If I can win her heart, then I will have seen love. But he knew, just because of what we described, that he couldn't come down out of his palace with all of his robes and all of his glory, and he couldn't somehow come down and, and reveal who he was because she would be so overwhelmed. Of course she would say yes. But he would never really know if he had her heart. And so, for a time, he set aside his crown, and he took off his royal robes, and he put on uh, the, the, the garments of a beggar. He took on the, the speech of the street, and he walked the street until he casually bumped into her, and then began the long process of trying to win her heart. Of course, for her, he was just another tawdry stable boy, and so she she refused him and spat on him and rejected him. But his love for her continued. Frustratingly um, for us, you know, Kierkegaard oftentimes leaves the, the parable untold, the, the, you know, the ending of the parable unfinished. And so we're left with the question, so was he able? Was he able to win the heart of this stable girl? And it really is the question of the gospel, isn't it? You know, as the, as the baby Jesus comes to us, will our hearts be so moved? Will our hearts be so invited to fall in love with this one who, who seems to be so human and yet brings to us such undeserved love? whole new understanding of love, it's no wonder that the New Testament explodes with agape love and this new experience of what it is that, that Jesus has brought to his people. It's, uh, it's, it's this kind of love that comes. It might almost seem like, uh, like um, that kind of love takes over and, and drives out all of the rest of the love. It's like that kind of love is Christian love, and oftentimes people think that, um, that the other kinds of loves are other passions for friendship or, 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 uh, or sexual relationships or, or affection um, with the, the things that are in this world that somehow they take a back seat to this love. But it is this love, this agape love, that then all of a sudden allows all of those other loves to take their proper place. All of their other loves to be able to be rescued from the hands of our own sinfulness. And so as we take our human frailty and we move into marriage or we move into friendship or we move into love for the country, all of those things, if they're, if they're tainted by our human um, uh, sinfulness, it threatens to make them all go bad. None of them can last if they're broken because we're broken. But with the infusing of this new God love, all of a sudden, God's love not only does not vanquish all of the other loves, but enters into them and allows us to see friendships and marriages relationships with children in an entirely new way, in fact, can 
burst the bounds of those former understandings of love and take us to entirely different places. There's a story that was written by Richard Seltzer uh, in his autobiography as a surgeon, and, uh, and he recounts this incident. He says, um, I stand by the bed where a young woman lies, her face post-operative, her mouth twisted in palsy, clownish. A tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth, has been severed. She will be thus from now on. The surgeon has followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh, I promise you that. Nevertheless, to remove the tumor in her cheek, I have cut a little nerve. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed, and together they seem to dwell in the evening lamplight, isolated from me, private. Who are they? He and this wry mouth that I have made, who gaze at and touch each other so greedily. The young woman speaks. Will my mouth always be like this? She asks. Yes, it will, I say. It is because the nerve was cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man smiles. I like it. And all at once, I know who he is, and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in an encounter with a god. And unmindful, I see he bends to kiss her cro crooked mouth, and I so close can see how he twists his own lips to accommodate hers, to show the kiss still works. And I remember that the gods appeared in ancient times as mortals, and I hold my breath and let the wonder in. The love of God does not vanquish our other loves, nor set aside our need for them, but rather fulfills them, shapes them, molds them according to a heavenly that allows us to be servants in this world. Love never ends. There's a story about um, St. John after uh, Jesus' resurrection and the coming of, of Pentecost, and he met with his disciples, and he would often teach his disciples and, and tell them about uh, the presence of love. Christ in them. And uh, at one point, uh, one of his disciples said, so John, all you ever talk about is the love of God for us and our love for one another. Can't we move on to something else? And uh, the story goes uh, that John looked at him and paused. And then he said, um, well, but there is nothing else. 